20 years or so. A lot can happen in a building. We all rearrange our furniture. Uh, some people do it nearly every week uh, and want to close up windows and open up spaces and move on to the patio and look enough to have a space like that. So it's constantly evolving. That is, that is, of course, that's what historians do, whether it's a building or a society or a town or a city, uh, how change comes about. But of course, you can only address that if you have the material, the sources. And uh, the sources are there, but we don't always know about them. They're locked away. The people who own them don't, sometimes don't. So that brings us into the archive. And the historians are very parasitic. Uh, we don't have archives and museums with good curators and archivists working and cataloging. We really can't go anywhere. We're just simply regurgitate. So that was my brief and um, to talk about this wonderful building. Uh, and how it was actually built, the actual process itself. Uh, I wanted to make the point that it was also a residence uh, for uh, probably its first 70 or 80 years. Uh, people lived in it, babies were born in it, and people died here. Um, they, uh, most of the rest of human life, of course, happens here. The fights, the feuds. Uh, the friendships and all the rest of it. I think it's particularly important to focus on the building just at this point because the building in its place, in this place, this city, uh, is undergoing immense change. Now, maybe this is health and safety issue here, but would it be possible to put off the top light, please? Uh, because uh, it, better, yeah. it, it will make it a lot better for, for, for some of you. I think we'll still have enough light that we need yeah. to escape. <laughs> and anyway, uh, somebody will switch the light. So it's perfect. Thanks. Well, it's which is all that need. Exactly. <laughs> when the alarm starts. <laughs> so this place, of course, the space, the city is changing. And this place in particular is changing. Across the street, uh, you're told we have a skyscraper, 16 stories, that will in shadow this building, encase it. Uh, and the area from here up towards the bridge is about to be uh, changed. Whether it will be developed for the better or for the worse, we don't know. But it is a process. And I think we in the museum, and I, I say we, uh, I don't work in the museum, but we who are here today, we who are interested in the space, in the building, in the whole concept of the hunt, uh, have, I think, an interest in that. And we, we should be engaged in that process. Uh, this, of course, you'll all recognize as a possible Lawrence. Uh, this is a Lawrence uh, image. Probably the new technology has uh, taken color of it, uh, but I think it gives a great sense of the building in its place uh, with the old warehouses, which in bulk and that do in some ways evoke uh, what replaced them in the 1970s, what we now know as Sarsfield House. But you'll notice that unlike Sarsfield House, uh, there's a gap there, there was a road there, rolled through two warehouses and there was a great gate there into the custom house yard which we now know as the park outside. So that was one change that took place in the 60s, uh, in, sorry in the 1970s. And you can see also that they, uh, they, some of this remains, some of it is gone, same here and so on. You recognize the courthouse easily and of course the cathedral. So that's the place where, so the building, no building should be looked at, I think, simply on its own. Uh, 
the building occupies a place. So the building is more than just simply the front door and everything from there on in. I don't want to start giving you too much text or too many people say, well, it's history, so I won't go because there's too many facts and figures. Historians are actually much more interested in issues and questions, really. But a few pointers will help me make some general points about it. But what is a custom house anyway? What is what are custom houses? And we know that for almost as, well, not quite as long as the city has been a city, but almost, uh, there has been a custom house. So what do the custom houses do? Um, well, the person in charge of the custom house, his name was, and it was always he, was a collector. He was the collector. He was simply the collector of revenue. He was the collector general. And the collector in the custom house has a direct descendant today. And you and I, we all have an intimate relationship with them. <laughs> and we furnish our returns to him dutifully. And if we don't, he will come yeah. and love him. Uh, and from an early point, the collector lived in custom house as well. And it was a merchant's key. And part of the story of this place is the movement from merchant's key to here, which takes place, it was going to be moved to the Mar Dyke, the dike or ditch separating the city from the river. Uh, essentially where Char Charlotte's Key is, running straight uh, north from here. Uh, and that was the plan in 63. But 64, it had changed. It was actually not going there. It was moving a hundred yards or so to here. And that's part of the intriguing story of this building. This is probably uh, one of the, this is the earliest good good image of the city. Uh, and 1685, why do I say good? Because scientific analysis, you know, good cartographical analysis of the maps show that everything here lines up with what we know was geographically in situ at the time. Before this, there are lots of images of the city. They're all showing the castle, they show the cathedral. They'll show the river, probably swans as well. Probably about 18 of them. Uh, it probably, you know, it's as precise as that, but it's some, some very often it's fanciful. It's just to give an impression or a notion of the thing. But this one does line up and lines up extremely well. And we're looking here at the old Coleman Bridge, which was replaced, and the English town dominated at one end by castle, the other end by the cathedral, and the docks, the Limerick docks. And that's where the boats went. The boats went, every boat had to go into the docks, so the goods could be unloaded at the docks. They were much, much smaller boats than uh, exist today at points. You simply can't get up here this far uh, today with big boats. Uh, but then the boats be very comfortably accommodated in the shop marked by these two shops with the garnet portrait of the space. And now some of you may have well parked your car up there. It's still garnet, I think. Oh. And, and your car will be there for you. We uh, so the potato market is that's the boundaries of the old dock. There still is a lot of filling in there. And this is where we're standing, just somewhere around here. Uh, this is the water gate uh, of the Irish town. So English town, Irish town, and no new town hardly at that stage. Here's yeah, the beginnings of the dike, the Marta. So we're roughly here, but we certainly weren't there. There was nothing much capital and sheep and people wandering about. Um, so we have um, described to the dock. Uh, it's narrow, it's small, boats queued up. 
board of commanders was unloaded, and this was the custom house. So this is, if you walked along the wall of the cathedral today, you walked along that wall there, uh, towards the gate, which used to be cathedral, which rel relatively recently conserved it here, with the courthouse here, you passed the site of the old custom house. But I'm not here to talk uh, about the old custom house. We know a certain amount about it. There's some descriptions. We have a description from 1704, a great stone house. Maybe this one, but I've no direct evidence. It's a very emphatic name. Simply I'm saying that because it is a great house uh, and it is in the right place at the dock. Uh, we know the description for a different type. But I think there was a room. Uh, the custom house did move around. Of course, it left here as well. It went into Sarsfield House. Uh, the Red Room, of course, would soon move online. It would probably be placed in Calcutta before we know it. So, why did Limerick lead a new need, or why did it get a new custom house? Uh, you know, it's probably the economy at the end of the day. Um, this looks a very technical thing, and it took a scholar many, many months to, to do this. But the, big, the, the message is clear. From 1700 to 1800, Limerick was prospering. You know, there's, there's, there's no other way about it. It was a good place to be if your business was making money or earning money. Uh, from four thousand tons a year in 1700, uh, it doubles by 1750, and that's the period we're talking about. That's when this building is being built. And again, literally goes through the roof. So it's a good place to be, and clearly the custom house was becoming very busy. But it was the custom house, as we know, was also old and was in a cramped place. And it had been replaced several times. And this man Edmund Sexton Perry. Uh, we all are familiar with the name, and I think we all should uh, emphasize the significance of Perry. Uh, he was, I think, truly the maker of modern Limerick. Uh, he was vain enough to call the new town where we're standing in now uh, after himself, New Town Perry. And we have streets and squares and nightclubs and pubs called after him. How do we wish to be remembered? Well, it, what he wanted to be remembered by, perhaps not a nightclub, but uh, he wanted to be remembered by his new child. And this was his plan. It's not a map. A map is what's there. A plan is a dream. So he was a dreamer, but this is what he wanted for the city. Why? Like, was he a patriot? He was certainly a patriot in the terms of the time. He wanted it because he actually owned the land. And if he was doing good, he would also do well. Uh, so he planned this, and part of his plan, which is part of it, you know, he had it well thought out, was that the old custom house, which had been here, where my finger is. Uh, he wants it out into the new town, which was going to be here. Uh, but he didn't have full control on this piece of land, but he had full control on this piece of land. It took a lot of maneuvering because, you know, there were people who owned the old building, there were people who owned the proposed new site. And he wanted Neither. He wanted it here on his land. He had this vision of development, as he saw it. He was a speculator, like all developers. He was ambitious with the day. He had an idea of squares, open spaces, market houses, and so on. And it bears a strong resemblance, those of us who walked the place. Uh, recognize it in a sense. Uh, you know, we know that this isn't it, but that the old English town and the Irish town. It 
can see this is the, uh, the man that's thinking in the 1760s, Edmund Saxton Perry. Uh, and like a lot of ambitious speculators, he wanted a star architect. And uh, he got his way on that, he had opposition. Um, getting an architecture commission is, 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 is very important for the architect, it's important for the client, but uh, it's very, very difficult for him to do. I'll try to summarize here what is quite a complicated building history, but there, it's worth, I think, seeing it not so much as perhaps the background to this building, but as a kind of a case study in how buildings come about. Uh, architects will tell you that most architectural dreams, most planning dreams are never realized. It would be wonderful if we could knock that. Uh, and so you know, we've all heard those ambitions that are not realized. And artists know that and certainly architects. Architects have made so many proposals over the years they know that it's only a chance. Building to be built on the Marbach across the street from down Charlotte King. John Smith, a well placed Dubliner, was to be the architect. And he did a design and was accepted by the Revenue Commissioners in their headquarters in the, in the Custom House in Dublin. Uh, he lives in Dublin, so the local Edward Ozzard uh, was appointed to be the man on the site, on the spot. And that's practiced today. Uh, the rugby, I'm not sure what it is, it's a museum, whatever the <laughs> thing up there. Uh, uh, the architect lived and worked in London, but he had somebody on the ground. Uh, and that's the executive, the executive architect. So Edward Roosevelt is a local. Uh, he's just built the bridge, the new bridge, where the Matthew Bridge is now. A very elegant hunt back bridge. Uh, uh, so he improved himself. And uh, so he was involved. We don't know exactly the moment when Harry met uh, Ducart. Ed, Edmund Perry met David's girlfriend. We don't know the actual moment. Could have happened in Cork, where Descartes seems to be living. Could have happened in Dublin, where Perry was spending a lot of time as a member of Parliament. Uh, but he was taken by him, and he decided he wanted Descartes to design his new custom house. Now oh, that's an ironic his. Was ours, the people, but he wanted it to represent him and his ambition for the city. I'm not going to say you see this is all happening very fast over a two or four year period. But one architect is replaced by another. And uh, sadly, Uzzel died. But this is kind of how I think. This might be a clue as to when Perry met, when Edmund, when Ed met Daviso, Italian pizza Irishman. Uh, uh, he, he arrived in it to be the executive, the man on the ground. So he got in at the ground, so to speak, uh, but very quickly he had displaced Smith. Uh, but having got the job and having been contracted to be on the spot to execute it, he actually didn't spend much time around, didn't spend much time in the delivery. And he too had his executives, first the Captain Connolly, and then um, another man, Christopher Collis, a few Kenny man. We know quite a bit about Collis, we don't know much about Captain Connolly. Presumably an army engineer who was out on pension and was doing a good job for him. 
This is probably the most important of them all, William Byron. He was a local, he came from a family, well-established family of local builders. And their big success story was John Square. Uh, he had been the foreman, manager, executive of the John Square project. Clearly was successful. Nowadays you notice the way the city is signing and pointing. Uh, and up away from here, further and further uptown. And there's one street uh, close to the top of the town and it's actually signed by the city as the Georgian Quarter. So one street, in other words, Perry Square. The Georgian Quarter is here. It starts in John Square and it goes right up to the crescent and right down to the river. That's Georgia, not the small little sanitized space that hopefully would be safe for uh, heritage. Well, heritage is everywhere, there's sand uh, on it and in it. And luckily, we know so much about the building of this place, we even know the names of the the stone masons. Uh, it's probably. We were very close to having a group here of the, uh, the key people. Uh, like these are the key people in the his building history of this place, but it's the first building that we actually have a history of. Like, the cathedral is there like seven or eight hundred years at this stage. A lot has happened, we know a lot about it, but we don't have many names. This is kind of a complete dictionary of who did it or who done it. Um, who was this at the time? Tackle is not probably the right term. He himself called it, he called himself a PM Maltese, but of the, the Alps now. Uh, the capital of that would be Turin, uh, now part of Italy then an independent uh, kingdom. This is how he spelled his name originally, how he spelled it. This is when he arrived off the boat, that was his name. He anglicised it to this. Um, this is how he signed it. He wrote many letters and they have survived. This is how he signed it. People don't seem to like using that. They come up with their own versions. Which they can do. But <laughs> that's his name. No other name to be used. Uh, what did he do? This summarizes uh, his project. Um, four complete buildings. There have been literally dozens of attributions. It's a favorite game amongst architects and architecture historians. Oh, it must be. It must be. Uh, you know, it must be by Norman Foster. It must be by Whoever, wherever the latest is. Um, it's unfair to history, it's wrong, downright wrong, unless you have documentation, uh, some direct evidence, and uh, we know that we did these. Now, that doesn't mean to say that a builder didn't copy some of his little stylistic quirks. I'll move on to those in a moment. Uh, so a building begins to have things that look like what he might have done. <coughs> but you notice here after these four major buildings, he changes gear and he moves into engineering. He wouldn't have made much of a difference, distinction between engineering and design and architecture. Uh, there certainly was a period she didn't have the structural engineer, the mechanical engineer that we talk about today, and all the other types of engineers. Um, so, he did a lot of what we now would call civil engineering, parts, canals, uh, roads, uh, bridges, and so on. But you can see there, it's very concentrated. Uh, like, like, you know, like any element, he arrives mature people as adults, so their time and place is relatively limited. We know he died in Dungannon. Um, uh, 
about 20 years after uh, we arrived here. So his buildings, this is the first building he built, and some of you might know this, uh, some of you might have visited it, some of you might even have stayed in it. Uh, today this is, of course, the Mercy Hospital in Cork. It was built as a mansion house for Cork. Now I want you to uh, just look at uh, the building, try and get a visual image of it. Uh, like if you close your eyes, could you describe it to me? That type of little game. Uh, so that's his first built at the start of the uh, 1760s. Uh, the second is ours. Uh, there are some similarities, you know, in the symmetry. Uh, if you look closely, the photograph is in the gold and white. I could have gotten a modern photograph of the Mercy Hospital Corp. Probably three ambulances outside. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get one. This photograph is the earliest from about 1870. Of, uh, but if you look closely at the windows here, uh, these windows up here, the treatment at the top is the same here and there, and so on. There's another thing you'll see kind of a rhythm here. Two, three, two, you know, one, three, one, almost a, you can almost see it in musical terms, and he would have seen it in musical terms. The designers of this type of building, the followers of another Italian architect, saw buildings very much in terms of melodic form. Her building, that we know here, is very one calls a farmhouse, but if it is, it's a very comfortable farmhouse in North Cork, in Channing. And it is a one tree one, just like ours. Uh, and again, you notice the window uh, pushed up with the lows, as they're called, coming down. You have it here, you have it here. So we're beginning to notice the language that he's using. A lot of this is simply fashion. Uh, you know, this is this is the style of the time, and he is a part of that. This building, the front here, the facade is flat. It's all on one plane. Ours, what we call the frontispiece, is coming forward, just a block or two. He does it here again. It's so almost as if he's kind of learning as he's going along. What will the client go for? What will the client like? And his fourth and final major building project. We spend an hour looking at the evolution from this to this, from the flat, almost hurried look in this one, to a much greater degree of sophistication. Got up close, you can see much greater detail, carved, and so on. The front is piece of sketch. And what will we have we now? We have two, three, two, just as we had two, three, two. Look at this, because here on the first floor, we have it here again. This here could almost be this, except that it's treated a little bit more elegantly, it's given a bit more space. This, of course, is a squashed urban space on the dock side in Cork. It's a little bit better here, it's new land. So there's a bit of space here, you could, might even have side wings, as we do. We have any amount of space here. It's on the top of the hill, and the man who built it owns everything else around. And it's the same there. But at this stage, it could almost, it could be a if you were architecturally inclined, or if uh, some of your family was, you could take those images, cut them up, and say, right, come on, we're going to do a Ducart. Uh, no, we use that door, or that window, or that spatial view. The first thing you'd have to decide, many stories, well, three or four, uh, and many days. And how would it be? What would the rhythm be? And then you'd have it. So you come up with something entirely 
knew what it wouldn't be very much different. And you'd have a plan, of course. Now, I realise that this is too far away from Wall Street, but these are the four buildings again in the plan. And I'd like you to know it's just one or two little facts that I think are of interest. The width, this scale. Uh, we know our bit, we're sitting in it. Uh, but its width is exactly the same as the width, exactly, like two or inch, literally, as the mayor's house in Cork. Uh, these two horrible buildings, the two large, uh, grand, big houses in the countryside, where there's much more land. They're bigger, not much bigger. Uh, and they're the same width, the same width as each other. And then if you look, there's these curious little box buildings at the end uh, of a wing, these little pavilions, we can call them, and they're the same size, the same dimensions here and there. And you see here, this is a, a tree, essentially, three oblongs, one, two, three. We have it here, one, two, three. We have front and back arrangement of rooms in the two grand country houses. And the central axis here and here. So internally, there's a lot to be said in terms of uh, his, his manner, his style, his way of doing things. Uh, this is the first illustration we have of our building, and uh, it is published in the history of delivery when the building isn't finished. That's always dangerous, of course. Um, and I've blown up uh, an inscription on this one here, praising the king in Latin. And for some reason, um, it wasn't um, executed, George III. Some might say, oh well, no, no way would we in Limerick ever. Oh. So, but we did, and sometimes do. So uh, I don't know if the Patriot game uh, has been played here. Uh, but these, of course, are the Corinthian capitals, uh, which were intended. And the next drawing we have of it, in 20 years later, 1786, in the second edition of the same book, and the author says, NB, there are no capitals to the columns. So that raises the question, why not? It's very often the case, and it is certainly the case here, the money uh, was running out and certain things didn't get built. We all know about cathedrals that had to exist for years without their spires, uh, and of course some of you are still waiting to build the extension. Uh, so hopefully you will, and uh, you get the mortgage increase. Uh, but there were problems on the, on the, uh, with the building. Like, so the original plan, the original budget was for 4,000. Crept up every few months, another 100, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000. Went over the 10, probably came in at 11,000. Okay, if you were a builder and an architect, because you've got 5%. Um, the term of the revenue commissioners uh, who had to face parliament and answer about overruns of what's new, you might say, or what's our <laughs> what, yeah, how different is it from what we know today. Another example of the sort of the, the, <coughs> the misfortunes of the building trade, and please do have sympathy for builders, and uh, even bad ones sometimes. They are deserving, like uh, 
He's changed the plans, but he doesn't give us new drawings. And again, anybody who's dealt with architects and builders know that story all too well. But it got built, and it takes on, it took up its place very comfortably. This is the first picture we have of it in situ. You know, it's, a, it's an image of the city uh, from uh, history at the time, uh, Ferrer's director. So, and this of course is the zone bridge, not replaced recently enough by the natural bridge. Um, now, at the start, I said I was going to look at the business of living in. I referred to the collector, collector's house. Somebody please tell me at the time, I can't see my own watch from here. Quarters to two, okay, so I have about 10, 12 minutes. I'm going to try and Increase the pace of the tour. Um, it is a dual purpose building. It's a, it's a, a tax office and it's a residence for the collector. Uh, when you walk around to the river front, uh, the principal front here, and you, let's say you've just arrived on a boat. You'd be forgiven for thinking, right, I'll go in and I'll pay my dues. You might head for here. Um, like that's intuitively what we tend to do. The, the tax entrance, the office entrance, uh, is here. It's through the side arcade, it's in through here. And that brings you into the staircase, this chamber out here, um, that you can see here. Um, so this is the main route up from outside, from your boat. And you come up and you come in through here into this room. And this room is now referred to as the captain's room. I'm not sure why, but probably because it sounds more real than its original name. The name it had for 200 years. The long room. Traditionally in the custom house, Sees in Dublin, it sees in Cork, and sees in London. The custom house, the business room was the long room. I think that's because the first room, the first custom house, it was indeed a very long room. So up into the long room, and this is where we are. Uh, and if you were going to visit a social visit to the collector and his family, you went in <coughs> through here. And uh, just uh, in under this arch. And you came in to the vestibule, the cloakroom, and then into the staircase here. And incidentally, uh, I think the youngest person in the audience today is doing his leading project on this building. And 
pretty, we're all really glad that he is here. Uh, and uh, as I was saying to him just before we started, if you want to get a sense of the true sense of the original building, it's in the staircase uh, at the far end of the building, just 30 feet away. And when there, you can walk up the stairs. And when you get to the top floor, you see three or four doors on the top landing. And they all, of course, were leading into bedrooms. So more than half of the house was actually given over to the domestic and the residential. And as I said at the start, people lived and died, were born and entertained uh, in this building for a great number of years. And so we see it in two ways. I think strongly a residence for the most important man in the city, at least in civic memory, whatever about ecclesiastic. In a period when all revenue comes through the custom house, there's, uh, there's no income tax as we know it. Uh, taxes rates for the state through trade. And this is it. If these buildings didn't exist, the state wouldn't have existed. It is the ultimate state building. And here's it from the street side. And you could say here, I just Heard it this morning looking at it. And this came from a colleague last night. Uh, it's Limerick's first purpose built office building. Indeed, it doesn't look much different uh, from some furniture people. Uh, so, and we see it in that. Sort of dual, a dual aspect and a dual purpose building. Um, if we had a longer lecture, I would go through each floor. I would take us up to the bedroom floor here. Um, and we'd look at the grand parlor and the eating room and so on that the collector had. And we'd pay tribute to the first collector who lived here. In fact, the man who really took over the project when the cash was hugely contested. And that, of course, was the first collector to live here, Caleb Paul. And Caleb's family are still living in the area, uh, in, in, in the Limerick area. Now, it was a pure custom house and residence, but again, it's a theme of adaptation. It started to change its uses. Uh, and I think partly because uh, Limerick wasn't as prosperous, there wasn't as much trade going in, space was becoming vacant, rooms weren't being used, and the Office of Public Works, the Board of Works, as it was called, always on the lookout for space for different functions and so on. So it started to eat into the custom house. And one of the consequences of that was it started to put other, other functions. The customs was asked to move aside a bit and make room for, amongst other things, the post office. And extensions, you know, you know, the extension is surely much more in Irish building history, it's every bit as important as the building itself. The extension is always is always looming. Uh, it's things about the death of many, uh, a fair bit of it. So extensions here, uh, being added on, thrown up literally on the roof, here and there. And soon a lot of the original building begins to disappear under the fabric of its additions. And I'd say to our leading certain student, you know, part of your challenge in trying to write building history up here is to actually trying to establish where, where is the real building. Like there are people who pass it every day who believe that our shop wing, our entrance wing, is part of the original building. And that's it. It's a, it's a very new building, but it's, it was 
bit in an attempt to look like the old people. Again, this is nothing to be remembered or talked about, but to just give you a quick idea, a quick overview of all the different functions and chops and changes that were taking place uh, until we arrived to the Hunt period and its opening in 97. Uh, from the 1820s, Revenue, uh, the excise and revenue, uh, the, the drink tax, they're being separated, they're given separate offices. The post office is brought in, a lot of the uh, original street front has changed at that point. Uh, there hadn't been a door on the street front, and it gets a door there, but your name of it uh, relatively recently, and of course, was replaced by the present. Uh, I'm not sure uh, the background to it, but proposals were being made in the 1850s uh, to move it down to Mount Kent, probably because the docks were moving down the river. Remember, the docks started, um, probably the docks started somewhere up around the castle, uh, just under, just before Curric Hour Hall. Then they moved down to the potato market. Then it, this would have been. The head of the docks here, uh, the bigger the boats, uh, the more confined they were to the lower part of the river. So the new docks, the dry dock, and all that was being built at this time. So logically, the custom house would move down. It wasn't built at the time, and so on. Court house, the court bay, tax court bay, or wills, and so on. The moment of glory comes in 1939, and it becomes the headquarters of the air raid um, defense system of the city. Um, there's a little diagram ARP, air raid precaution scheme, area number one. It became the control headquarters of it, the one with the term, the custom house, telephone 689. So you hear that. Planes are coming up the estuary, and you're trying to get through to 689 to alert them. And they, in turn, will elect outpost telephone 196 at the Lansdowne factory, please. And so on. Dillon's Yard is another outpost, and uh, down to St. Michael's Temperance Hall. I hope the telephone was being attended that night, um, but it didn't happen, so we were safe. Uh, they, there's a wonderful plaque, I'm sure many of the friend, your friends have seen it, it's inside the, the just outside the administrative offices uh, on the top floor, um, and it was rescued from outside the building before ceased its long history and it just gives it, it's very nice to look at it because it gives us kind of a summary of what's yeah. actually happened here in the 90s up to the 90s customs and excise in the long run this room uh, the mercantile marine office ships reports the registry of shipping the receiver of wreck wonderful term mm -hmm. uh, we have all the jobs the man I would have liked the cash office. A man came here the other day and he said he used to work in Boyd's uh, as a 14 year old. And uh, he remembers being sent down to the cash office to pay some bit of revenue and something that was being imported. Uh, licenses, customs and excise duties, open to the public, and so on. Um, so we moved to the conclusion then. Uh, just to make the point again about, this is a photograph from one of the big rooms in uh, Dugard's first bit in the, ma the mayor's house in Cork. And uh, a wonderful room which is exactly the same size as this one. Uh, there's only one difference though, if you look up, um, you see these half lights. And of course they're up there still. The ceiling is not, as so, so many of us think, uh, is not in it. 
an 18th century ceiling, it's a 20th century, a late 20th century ceiling. It bears no relation to what was there before, but it just shows you if you've got good crafts people what you can do. In the right light, and turn on the lights in a moment, uh, you can see, just see, because the plaster work isn't so good, you can see the, the, the evidence of the tree lights. And of course, if you look up the building from outside on the street, you say, oh, I know those three lights, these, those three lovely long windows, we were in that room a few minutes ago, but there's three more windows uh, on top of them. So, um, my point of purpose here today is simply to, I suppose, to get us to look and think about the history of the building, and particularly when it's just about uh, to face a lot of activity. I think we need to engage, we really didn't engage, I think, in the project that will affect us most in the years to come, uh, the so-called Arthur Centre. Uh, I hope we do engage in this equally important one, the Arthur's P project when it starts. I like to think that the, um, the two boys there, uh, the gentlemen in the top hats mm -hmm. going around, they're making plans um, and they're saying what should be done and how it should be done. And they don't all always talk to us, but I think we should engage with them uh, about our space. And it really remains me then to thank uh, my team, not the men in hats, uh, but these four people, uh, all friends of mine, uh, who, who uh, supplied me with information, images, who did wonderful drawings for me, particularly Ryan and Nico. Uh, uh, so, lads, if you're listening, you're not them, but you must talk to them. We must all talk to them before they decide that uh, maybe this building has had its day. So thank you. Pleasure.